just waiting for us to load up here and once we load up then I will take it uh, from the good morning my youtubers good morning my Facebook family and friends it's a pleasure once again to be here with you uh, first of all I'm gonna apologize for last night <laughs> last night I was supposed to do this teaching and five or ten minutes within the teaching uh, everything went blank the the electricity went out we had some thunderstorms and lightning last night and I think we had an island-wide uh, shutdown with the power so as a result of that uh, you didn't get my video <laughs> but you know what it was a blessing and the reason why it was a blessing was because it happened initially when I started teaching because I would have really been upset had I been like one good 20 30 40 minutes in and and the power went out so it was out just about all night I think it came back on like about two three o'clock this morning so I guess it was a blessing so everything is fine now so I want to jump right into it this morning uh, I've never done a morning teaching believe it or not I don't well I don't think so and uh, my topic is teach me how to pray teach me how to pray and this teaching came as a result as usual where I have an influx of one set of particular emails and most folks were saying to me uh, brother Kevin I like the prayers that you give at the end of your teachings I would really like for you to do a teaching on that to teach me how to pray I've had people uh, well, I wouldn't say people had a person that had written to me who was saved for I think 10 or 15 years she said and she when she prays she's normally just you know feeling for words or whatever the case may be so nevertheless uh, I'm gonna address that now let me tell you about me first I my prayers are very uh, uh, strong and that came as a result of a lot of pain <laughs> in my life earlier <laughs> and I know most of you would have would agree with me because it's amazing how creative you become when you suffer a lot of pain and disadvantage and unfairness you could become extremely creative and most of the prayers that I pray they were birthed out of pain now initially I was praying that pain oh Lord take it from me Lord get them who's coming after me and all this other stuff until uh, the Lord showed me in a revelation uh, how to put more of his word in my prayer as opposed to my word and the reason for that was that a he already knows why I'm coming to him and B he's gonna respond to his word as opposed to my word so it was a matter of me correlating what I was going through during those times with specific scriptures that were relative and relevant to what I was praying for all right so this morning I I uh, want to touch on three key points and just basic prayer just simple prayer a lot of people know how to pray a lot of people about half a minute into a prayer they'd lost for words they don't know what to pray so what I'm going to teach you this morning is three points. The first one is the purpose of prayer. What is it that you're really doing? What is it that you're really engaging? Secondly, we're going to deal with the rules of prayer. Yes, there are rules as it relates to prayer. And thirdly, we're going to deal with the contents and the context or the body of the prayers that we uh, usher up to God. All right? So firstly the purpose of prayer now I know if I would ask you that right now most people have different purposes for praying they would say they're praying for home finances and so on well that's not what I'm talking about initially the purpose of prayer is to invite God to intervene into your affairs I mean that's basically what you're doing at some point you realize that you have would have exhausted your human strength your human powers your human connections and therefore you decided to uh, allow God the Spirit to do supernaturally for you which you could not do for yourself had you been able to do it for yourself then clearly you would not have need God at all so the purpose of prayer is saying to ourselves 
I need help. But I'm not seeking mere mortals' help because that's limited, which would would have been the reason why you're seeking a a higher power or or a spiritual help. I need help and I need God to uh, assist me in this situation that I'm going through. So initially when we pray, we're we're asking God, we're saying to ourselves, we're humbling ourselves, and no matter what it is, whether it's about a marriage, whether it's about finances, whether it's about a job, it doesn't matter. You're saying, God, I need you in my life right now to take down this petition in my life that I cannot do by myself or with the aid of other mere mortals, other human beings. That's very important. So whenever we decide to get on our knees, whenever we decide to seek God, sorry, seek prayer, we're, we're, we're dealing with an invisible entity. And this is key. And I would believe that the mere fact that you actually getting all the way down on your knees and seeking God, that you must believe that there is a God. I mean, you would be kind of crazy to go uh, on your knees and don't believe that you're actually praying to a spiritual being, right? So uh, definitely we're praying to God when we uh, seek prayer. Now, when we're praying to God, our approach is very, very important. And I said this in many of my teachings before, even though I wasn't teaching about praying, but I remember a recent teaching that I did, many of you would remember that call, uh, sending prayers back to send this uh, demonic witchcraft prayers. You should never be doing that. And I'm picking that particular teaching because, again, you, you're now analytically looking at your attitude towards prayer because someone did something to you and you weren't able to get an advantage on them, humanly. So you're trying to contract God to do your dirty work for you. So basically you're saying, God, I mean, I know you exist, and I really hate Kevin. I'm sick of him. I'm jealous of him. So I need you to put a hit on him for me. So clearly God would never respond to a prayer like that. And of course, when I did that teaching... uh, I got a lot of hate mail for it, but they only proved my point that their approach, they they were filled with hate, bitterness, and unforgiveness, and you're already starting off wrong. So whoever God you're praying to, I can assure you, it's not the God of Abraham, it's not the God of Isaac. So we must deal with our hearts first. Look at our motives. Are you coming approaching the throne of God on the basis of of unforgiveness, on the basis of hate, on the basis of of bitterness and resentment and uh, being vengeful. Because all of these things that I'm listing off will disqualify you getting an audience with God. It's not going to happen. And we're going to look at those points today. So we have to deal with us. Many of you, many of you got up this morning and you did your morning prayers but there are some people in your life that you are unhappy with. And there are things that they did, whether it was recently or years ago. And you know good and well that you have yet to address that. Because the mere mention of their name or the thought of that person's name brings automatic resentment to you. So clearly, you have a heart condition, spiritual heart that is. And if you're planning on going to God for prayers or whatever you're praying for, I can assure you, I can assure you right now that you're praying in vain. And he's really not, he is not hearing that. And again, I will show you the scriptures. This is not my opinion. God is not hearing your prayers. So it's vital that if you're going to take, if you're going to make the time to pray, no matter how you do it, you have to deal with you. Before you come to God about that job situation, that promotion, your health, your finances, or whatever, it is imperative that you do a, a, a heart check. Check your heart to make sure that is cleared up. Because one of the scriptures uh, says, and, and I quote this all the time, Proverbs, not Proverbs, Psalm 66 and 18. And it says, if we regard iniquity in our heart, if we retain that in our heart, it says God will not hear us. So as you can see, this is not my opinion. 
yeah, I know you feel a certain way. Yeah, I know you're being taken advantage of, but if you're not dealing with your... See, it doesn't matter what you're approaching the throne of grace for. Have you met the, the protocols prior to coming there? And the scripture I just gave you in Psalm 66 and 18 is one of them. Another one is uh, Isaiah 59 verses 1 to 2. And it says that, and I'm going to paraphrase it, it says, God is not deaf that he cannot hear us. Neither is his arms short that he cannot reach us. But it goes on to say in part B, it says, but, but your iniquity has separated you from or divided you or put a space between you and your God. And your sin has caused him to literally turn his face from you. So let's see if you meet the, 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 the criteria or the criterium in approaching God to hear you. Let me see. Let's take it off now. Uh, I got it in for my brother. He did something to me at least 14 million years ago, and I refuse to let that go. Uh, I'm jealous of my co-worker. Mm. So these are sins. These are sins that you're retaining. And he says, if this sin is in your heart, he, he will. So he's telling you, Kev, make sure you check these things off before you come to me, okay? Because first of all, I knew the trouble with you and now, I knew you were going to have this before the day you were born. So that part of it is straight as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to deal with that. But I need you to follow the protocol to get the God kind of results that you're seeking. All right? Now, if you want human results, then go to the witch doctor. <laughs> okay? So, so he says in Isaiah 59 verse uh, 1 and 2, he says, His ears is not clogged. They're not jammed. He, I can, he can hear quite well from heaven. His hands are not sh short. He's not a midget. He, he, he can reach or he can send angels to reach you. But he says to you what's causing him not to pay any attention to you. And that is your sin, that is your iniquity. All right? You will not prosper in your prayer if you have sin in your life. And when I say sin, active sin. Uh, Proverbs 28 and 13 says that he that hides his sin shall not prosper. So your ability to prosper in that which you're asking God to assist you in prospering in, that cannot happen because you failed with that checkpoint there also. So you're, you're and people do this all the time. <laughs> you know, they, they actively fornicate and they actively commit an adultery. They're compulsive liars. But yet they go before the throne because they don't know these, these rules here. And they go there crying out to God with the, you know, crackly voice and oh god hmm, snorting up themselves as if your emotions is going to say to god let me god is going to say let me circumvent my rules because you you're snorting up a lot you know a lot here and there's a lot of tears here so i guess i can bend the rule for you that's not gonna happen so our approach is predicated on whether we meeting we're meeting the qualifiers for God to actually entertain us. So that means not because you just come and bend down and get on your knees that he's going to automatically be attentive to you or you're going to draw an audience with him. What's going to do that is if you're following the rules that will uh, cause him to give air to what you're saying, right? So let's go into now some of the rules for prayer, all right? And the first one that we need to deal with, which is what I just, just talked about, and I want us to turn there, and that is Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark 11, Mark 11 and 25. Mark 11 and 25. Well, listen here to what this is, all right? I'm not going to rush today. I really, really want you to get this because I really want you to, to get an understanding. So when you leave from here, your prayers are going to be very simple. You don't have to have no long prayers. You don't have to be screaming. You don't have to get loud. You don't have to go into sha ta 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 mandara so to to shi ti ti ti. You don't have to do none of that. All you have to do is follow the rules. <laughs> follow the basic simple rules. And you have an audience with God. And he have to 
make himself available to you because you would have followed the protocols and the requirements that he asks. All right? So Mark 11 and 25, Jesus speaking, he says, And when you stand praying, whenever you're praying, listen to the initial things you must do. He said, when you stand praying, forgive. Now, hold on, God. I come to you for the car. The sky need bad, man. I tired of catching right to work. I tired of my co-workers, them sucking their teeth every time I ask them if they could give me a lift home or whatever. Okay, I need a, what, what cars, what me asking you for car got to do with me forgiving somebody? That ain't your business. This is his rules. His rules aren't up for debate. So he says, and when you stand praying, forgive now why what if i don't forgive them but i still want the car from you well let's see what else it says the rule says and when you stand praying forgive if you have ought against anyone that your father also who is your father again god the one who you're coming to to make the 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 prayer request to that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Hmm. That's interesting. See, this is interesting because there's a word in this particular scripture that changes everything. And that word is uh, if. <laughs> yeah. He says, if you have odd against anyone. Now don't you could you could fool me. You could say, well Kevin, well I don't hate them. I just the mere fact that you could explain this to me, you hate them. <laughs> the mere fact that you just cannot you have to bring this up like to say, well I don't I don't know if God means it. No, 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 no. You know just what God means. And this is the reason why you're trying to justify your anger, your bitterness, your resentment, your hate, or you trying to put some kind of pretty uh sugar coated or whatever. But hate is hate, unforgiveness is unforgiveness. We don't need to do a class to figure this out. You know exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> All right? So he says, and when you stand praying, forgive. That's, that's, that's the first thing he says. If you have ought, if you have any issue with anybody, and, and not meaning that something went down. No, if the issues manufactured unforgiveness i want i want to be clear here that don't mean if if you and your co-worker had a little row yesterday no what he's saying is if if that row yesterday built resentment and hate towards you he says okay then forgive them because your forgiveness will become the requirement for me forgiving you hence i will not forgive you if you don't forgive them. Remember now, you're coming to God for, for whatever it is you want. You come, you want your children, college fees paid. You want to send them to college. You want a better job. You want a husband, a wife. Okay, we, I, your laundry list or your grocery list, sorry, from here to thy kingdom come. But let's follow the rules though because now many of you are going to see why others' prayers are being answered and not yours. So it says, for so if you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you. So God, God will not forgive you if you have not forgive others. That's that's pretty much clear to me. Now let's look at another scripture. Luke six and twenty-eight. Luke six and twenty. This one is interesting. And remember, we're still dealing with prayer, you know. Luke 6 and 28, right? Listen to what it says here. He says here, now after you already forgive those people who you have ought with, he says here now, bless them that curse you. Wow. Is I reading this right? Let me say this upside down here. <laughs> I must bless those who curse me. Okay. Bless those that curse you and pray for them. Pray for them. That despitefully use you. That's interesting. 
So it's interesting. Here's why it's interesting, because he's saying, before you come to me with what you want, deal with you. This is the key. I heard you in church screaming and rattling off in tongues. I heard you up on the pulpit when they called you to pray for the congregation, the pastor. You are good with those lengthy, beautiful prayers. But I hope you did all of the protocols prior to those prayers, because if you didn't, you were praying to the congregation and not to God Almighty. He said, now that you forgive, not, not the, in so much words, what he's saying is this. Okay, you, you said you forgive them, right? Now prove it. Let me, say, let me hear you pray for them now. Let me hear you bless them. Because that will become the empirical evidence that your statement in that you forgave them, this will now become the evidence. And if you're unable to say, Lord, bless Johnny, who robbed me on my job, bless Monica, who undermined me and caused me, got demoted. If you're not capable of doing that, then you did not forgive them. You did not forgive them. So I will hear his story. So I will hear, and I'm a human, you think but God. So let's be real here now, because remember now, we'll be, yes, I know we, we are praying to God, but we have to look deeper than us. We have to deal with us, because God made a requirement initially. He said, you forgive these people. If you have ought against them, anything was going on, forgive them so that I may forgive you now to prove to me you did that. To prove to me, to prove to yourself, really, because I know whether or not you do it. To prove to you that you did that. Now, let me hear you bless them in this prayer. Let me see you. Let me, let me see what the real deal is. Let me hear you pray for them. Let me hear you say, bless their children. Advance them, Lord. Cause them to get promoted. Father, I pray for their soul, their salvation. See, because God says you must meet these requirements before you come to me, but you want this husband. Before you come to me to bring your perfect mate. Before you come to me, but you want the supervisor position and all this stuff you want. Do your part. And I can surely, as God, do mine. So he says here in verse 28, bless those that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. A correlating scripture would be Matthew 5 and 44, which says basically uh, the same thing. Now, let's look at, and these are all rules. I'm giving you the rules to prayer. Let's look at Matthew 6 and verse 5. Matthew 6, and this is an interesting one. I love this one. Matthew 6 and verse 5. And listen what it says. This is a rule. So far, I'm giving you rules. I'm giving you rules to prayer. Remember, I started off. My first point was, what is the purpose of your prayer? The purpose of your prayer is you're inviting a spiritual being, which is God, because in this case, it's God, because, you know, people pray to their different altars. People pray to Satan and Buddha and Molech and all of these wickers and so on. So in all cases, in all cases, the general rule, whether it's on the sorcery side or the, or the believers of Jesus Christ side, we are now inviting God or we're inviting a spirit to intervene into our affairs. We're, we're seeking help because we've exhausted all of our resources uh, and now we're asking uh, deities to assist us. So here in verse 5 of Matthew 6, it says, And when thou prayest, whenever you pray, this is what he says, thou shall not be as the hypocrites, Hmm, who's a hypocrite? Somebody who says something and do the next. Thou shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street. They got to be seen. That they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 6. But when you pray, now these are Jesus' words. So therefore, these are his protocols that he left in prayer when we approach the throne of grace. He said, don't be like them out there. Okay, they peeping through what I care and watching me. Oh, Shantala, to, 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 po, 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 and start doing a bunch of foolishness. He said, don't be like them. Uh, don't don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't pray in tongues. I'm not saying, because people love to change the narrative, so I just have to be clear. What he's saying here is prayer is an intimate thing, and he's about to explain that in verse 6 of Matthew 6. Verse 6 says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter 
into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which see it in secret shall reward thee openly. I love that scripture, yeah? I love that. I, I have lived that. I am seeing that scripture manifest in my life on a, on a daily basis. What he's saying here is, listen, you're coming to me. Whatever you're coming to me with is a personal matter. It's a private matter. Hence, it ought to be dealt with as such. Now, that don't mean you shouldn't pray publicly for people. That don't mean none of that. We talk about you now. <laughs> he say, when you come, he say, pray, pray, and pray in secret. Now, I'll tell you something about me. People will look at me and say, boy, I know Kevin, just pray every day. I don't. I'd be a liar if I told you that. I don't. I don't. In fact, some mornings I get up, I don't pray. I don't. Here, here, here is how I, I pray. I could be, and when I say I get up in the morning and don't pray, that doesn't mean I don't have a conversation with God. I just don't get on my knees and do all the prayers and all that other stuff that you know most people do. I would probably, when I'm in the shower, I'll talk with God. I'm in my car. But they are, they are the, the most frequent things that I do. I could be, uh, I like the beach. I like to go on the beach, sit in my car. I like to hear the ocean waves. I love stuff like that. I love to read. I love to watch nice movies every now and again. There could be a time I could be deep into a movie. And I would have this unction to pray. I would pause the movie and go into prayer. And I'm talking intense, immense prayer. Come out of nowhere. So for me, prayer is like when the Holy Spirit descends upon me. And for the most part, I have the prayers on for me. It's like someone will come to my mind. Someone who asks me to pray for them. It's like, Holy Spirit said, come do it right now. Come seek the throne on their behalf right now. And I will just go into it. I There are times when I was deep into reading a book. I mean, really into it. And there's a passage of that book that I came upon and it brought some memory of something to my mind. In fact, I'll give you an example. I was reading a book one time and I think the book was about a testimony of somebody and they were talking about how God delivered them. Actually, the things that they were going through in life that they thought God was in hearing them. And when God delivered them, how happy they were. And it reminded me of a situation and it kind of brought tears to my eye because I could relate to the story. And I put that book down and just went into prayer. But the prayer was solely about thanking God. Like at that moment, I began to think about where I was. Not that it hasn't happened before, but and where he has brought me right now. Like, like no human did that. No education did that for me. No millionaire. Like everything that happened, happened supernaturally. So at that moment, you just go, God, I just thank you, man. I... And again, that's another thing with me. When I pray, it's almost as if I'm talking to Deidre or talking to someone who I'm very familiar with. And again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't come, oh, holy grace, oh, Dawat. I have a relationship with my God where I sometimes I say, man, like, yeah, you, you, you just carry on back. <laughs> because that's the kind of relationship that I have. So when I'll go into prayer and I say, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you. I thank you for... I remember the days that I thought I would have never sent my son to college. I remember the days I used to be worrying if I could make ends meet. I remember days when I wondered if, how am I going to drive this car from home, drop my kids to school, go to work and come back and not cut off on the road because I have no money. I don't have that problem now. And I just went into prayer. So that's what I'm saying. There, there, are, moments, there are moments where you... Just, you don't have to follow the routine of, okay, it's morning, let me go pray. Oh, it's night, let me go pray. There are moments where I just, I could be driving in my car, going to somewhere, whatever. And I just begin to think about the goodness of God, what he has done for me and so on. I just begin to pray, Father, I thank you. There are times, I think I said this to you before, there are times, and I'm only telling you this to show you that for yours, those of you who have a routine, sometimes it's good to break up that routine. There are times when I would go to a, a store, hardware store, clothing store, or Deidre and I were away. And we're in line waiting, and there are some people in there. And I would just begin to pray, Father, I pray that everyone in this department store, none of them, none of them will leave this earth 
unless they would have accepted you as Lord and Savior. I, I cover this cashier. She may not know me. She may have no idea. She don't have any idea I'm praying for right now. I pray for her. If she have children, I pray for her children. If she if she's married right now, I pray that you'd bless that union. I pray that they will become a beacon of light to the future generation spreading your gospel. See, you got to do these things because someone prayed for you. And you may never know. You may never meet that person. You may never, ever, none of that. So the idea here is to, to kind of step back from the routine. You don't have to be in a formal setting or it don't have to be prayer time to pray. You could pray anytime. Anytime you could pray. So that's how I do it. I mean, for example, I got up this morning. Yes, when I get up in the morning, thank you, Lord, for waking me up. Thank you for my family. Yes. But did I get on my knees and pray three, four hours? No, I didn't. No. Now, sometime through the day, I'll probably go into a nice prayer. Yeah. Probably after I finish up with y'all. See, and for me, that don't make me better than you. <laughs> that don't make you better than me. All right? That's just where I am at with God. And I'm sure you probably, you know, have your own thing going. So this is not to, to cast no kind of shade or nothing on you. So he said in here, pray in secret. Pray in secret. You know? And it says that, Listen to the reward of this, this protocol. And he says, what God is seeing you do in secret, he said, excuse me, he will reward you openly. So in so much word, expect a reward. Yeah. And that's why I love rules. Everything is governed by rules. See, rules uh, places in you something to look forward to. This is the expectation. In, in other words, it's God saying, this is how you measure me, Kevin. Remember the promise I gave you? Now, if you did it right, expect this reward. And I've seen that happen, right? Okay, so let's go to Matthew 6 again. See, Matthew, let's look at verse 7. It's going to give us some more. I point us on prayer. <laughs> and I love this one because we all did this. I used to master this in my earlier Christian walk, right? In verse 7 of Matthew 6, it says, But when we pray, but when you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. That's what I love about it. Sometimes, you know, people will say, Boy, Kevin, man, I wish I could have prayed like you. You don't wish to pray like me? Have a develop a relationship with your God. See, when you have a relationship with someone, you don't have to force a conversation. You never realize that. If you were to go, I remember when I worked at my job and I had to do, I had to travel because I had to travel quite a bit as a, a, a con executive. And a part of my job was going to different customers in that particular country. And you know, you meet them for the first time, so you gotta, you gotta keep the ball bouncing in there with the conversation because you don't know them. Now, if I met my, like if my best friend Clifford, Clifford came here right now, we talk for hours, literally. I mean, you gotta make up nothing. We just talk and talk and talk and talk. That is as a result of relationship. So what I'm saying to you is, don't mind the sister or brother next to you who have these lengthy prayers. And that's not to say that they're not genuine prayers. What I'm saying to you, you develop a relationship with your God. God, you know how I feel right now. I, I just don't feel like praying. And I've had prayers like this. I am broken, I am hurt, I am disappointed. And I don't know what to say to you. I don't know what to say to you. The only thing I can say right now, Lord, is that you just give me give me a peace. Give me that peace that passes all on us. Give me something to just take this repetitive thought. See, that's having a relationship. How many of you, how many of you, how many of you have had relationships in the past and the guy left you or the lady left you and went with somebody who got more money than you, look better than you, at a higher class in life than you. You're broken. You broke. You are totally broken. You, your heart and everything just break down on you. Now, you don't go before God with a broken heart like that and say, Oh, Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah Elohim, El Shaddai, Jehovah Mekadesh, Sitkanu, I come before you. You don't got time for that. <laughs> you don't want none of that. You, 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 you are torn. You are broken. So I'm telling you that because just how you would go to your friend or your mother, whoever your close partner is or whatever, and just how you would express yourself to them, that's how God wants you to express yourself to him. 
remove all of the whatever. Move the clutter. God, I, I'm, 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 God, I feel bad right now. And I really need you to, to fix me. Yeah, I need to be fixed right now. Fix me so I could, I could do what I need to be doing on a regular basis. All right? So he's saying here, yeah, don't, don't be like these dudes. Don't be with these long prayers, saying the same thing over and over. Oh, Lord, bless Kevin, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless him, Lord. Oh, God. Oh, Lord, bless him, Lord. Turn it around, Jesus. Jesus, turn it around from Lord. Turn it around. Turn it around, Jesus. Oh, I feel it in the spirit. Turn it. Turn it, Lord. Turn it. Just kick it. Just kick it back a little bit. Just right there. Turn it, Lord Jesus. Turn it, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Kevin, God is going to bless you. I hear God say. <laughs> I hear God say, he's going to turn around for you. Oh, he's going to turn around. Oh, so they just spend the last 45 minutes praying for you, saying, turn it around. You don't have no relationship with your God. If you had a relationship with your God, those words would just flow from you. Because you, it's a hard thing now. Things will just flow. Father God, meet Kevin at his need right now. Bless him. Yeah, bless him, Father God, but give him a new mind. Fill him with your spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Cause him to be elevated. Advance him in life. Bring him to where he should have been at this point in his life. Lord, bless his children. Bless his wife. Bless his ministry, Lord. Father, cause him to walk with dignity and decorum. Give him a, a spirit of humility. See, when you have a relationship with God, you flow. You flow. When you don't have a relationship with God, you're loud and you're repetitive. And right after that, every two words, the Holy Spirit. You ever met people like that? Everything they say, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit ain't got a chance to talk to me because he's always talking to them. Child, the Holy Spirit tell me this last night. Why did the Holy Spirit say that you ain't got a relationship with him? Anyway, I ain't go there. So he says here in <laughs> verse 7, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. They think that they should be heard. God know they're empty vessels just down there barking. He's paying absolutely uh, no attention to them. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. We almost finished. Luke 18, verse 1. It says, men are to always pray. Men are to always pray. We are always, and what that means is exactly what I told you just now. Always pray don't mean that you just pray in the morning and pray at night before you go to bed. Pray you. You should get in the habit. In the habit. In fact, there's a scripture I cannot remember it, where we are commanded by Jesus Christ Himself. He say, "Pray for the laborers to uh, come and get the harvest." So we should be praying that Father, I pray that more laborers will come on board, more ministers, more true men and women of God, to to win the souls for Your kingdom. That's what we should be praying. Because if we were to analytically go through most people's prayers. Most of their prayers are about them and their families. Very, if, if I had to put a percentage on it, I'd say about 0.1% is towards anybody else. Unless it's about trying to get that person to turn, to give them favor in something. But I thank God I kind of, I, I, I passed that stage where to me praying for strangers I pray for strangers just as frequent as I pray for my family members and myself. That wasn't always the case. That wasn't always the case. That was something that I literally had to uh, condition myself in doing. So yeah, when a guy overtake you and cut you off on the road, and rather than pop in those choice words, Father, I bless him. I pray for his salvation. I pray for our salvation. I pray that you remove that spirit of anger and impatience, Lord. See, because... When you understand the power of prayer, do you know how many people in on this planet walking, they don't know God, and that's bad. But what's even worse than that? No one is praying for them to know God or even to be protected. So many, and I think about the young people, especially the young men being gunned down and so on. You know, if someone was praying for them, some grandparent, some mother, someone, Someone who would have probably, that, prob that person who probably died yesterday or day before, someone who you know died, and you could say, boy, I remember I was just in the food store, and they were right in front of me last week, cashing their stuff. My Lord, I never knew that today they would have been burying them. Yeah? Did you take the opportunity to pray for them during that time? Did you say, Lord, I don't know this man in front of me. 
I don't know this one. I don't even know these children. I don't know what generational curses are on their life. They probably don't even know. But Lord, if it's there, break it right now in the name of Jesus. I, I don't know them, Lord, but I intercede for them right now. Whatever they are going through right now, God, take it from them. Whatever has been levied on their lives as it relates to ancestral sins. And they know nothing of but I do. I, you've equipped me with this knowledge. Father, under the authority of Jesus Christ, by the blood of Jesus, strip them of these negative things that will affect them in the future. Now here it is, they have no idea, no idea that your prayer, they never, they don't know you, they don't know you prayed for them, but what should have happened to them in the future through the ancestral curses levied on their life did not happen anymore. Why? Because when the unction of the Holy Spirit moved on you to pray, even though it might have seemed silly, I don't know them, you don't need to know them. There's no scripture that says you need to know people to pray for them, right? And you begin to pray for them right there and then. Let me tell you something, yeah. You we we if 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 the believers would be more proactive with their prayers, they we would see more positive results in the world. But unfortunately, something has to happen, like a COVID-19 or whatever. Then we want to go into prayer and warfare. And warfare was happening way before this in the spiritual realm. What we see now is the result of that. So that's why we need to be praying now, Father, whatever else is on the horizon, such as COVID-19, we're coming against it even now in the name of Jesus. See, and this is how we have to pray. So our prayers, our prayers should not just be centered around us. Okay? We, it, it is mandatory that we pray for others. It's mandatory. In fact, the scripture, what scripture is that now? Uh, Psalms 122 verse 6 I think it is and the scripture said that we if we want a blessing we must pray for Israel <laughs> yeah can you imagine that can you imagine praying you're from like me I'm from the Bahamas you're from uh, India or to Trinidad and Tobago and you're praying you're praying for your mommy your daddy everybody you pray on your job you pray for your co-workers you pray for strangers oh by the way Lord I pray for Israel the scripture tells you to do it. Psalms 120, Psalms 122, verse 6. Go read it. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I, I think it says that you will be blessed if you were to do that. So there are a lot of things in the scriptures that we're not familiar with where we are commanded to do, but we've been not aware of it. So Luke 18 and verse 1 says very clearly uh, that we are to always pray. All right? Now, I want us to look at Mark 11, uh, Mark 11, and I believe it's verse uh, 24, very powerful. So right now I'm giving you the rules, and once I'm finished with these rules, then we're going to go into how to uh, contextualize your prayer. I don't know that word me, but that sounds good right there. <laughs> no, but seriously. <laughs> Mark 11, verse 24 says, Therefore I say unto you, Jesus speaking again, he's giving you a rule. He's giving you a principle. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. Now that's powerful, boy. Oh yeah, that's powerful. I remember uh, uh, when I, uh, 2011, uh, when the position on my job had opened, and, and I knew I was gonna get it. They was asking for a lot of stuff I did now, but I wasn't into them, because I knew what I was praying for. And I remember the scripture quite well. And I said, Lord, I, 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 I said, Lord, I need this. I need the money, I need a change, I need, I need this. And after I would have, pray all my scriptures in the body of my prayer and then I say your word declares that whatsoever things we desire when we pray and I this is exactly what I said I said I believe this I said this job this promotion is my promotion I don't care nobody's gonna get this this is my time and I say your word say whatsoever things we desire when we pray we must believe that we have received it and we shall have it I believe I have it I believe that you cannot lie you can't so, I got it. <laughs> but I got it as a result. And you know something? Let me tell you something. This is so powerful. 
because when I go back in my life, I remember when I was in grade seven, I'll never forget this. I had just started high school, junior high, and I, I lived with my, my aunt in another part of the island. And anyway, uh, there was this, this, this uh, December of that same year, we were at this uh, local hardware store. And every year they raffled this like 14 foot stocking with candies and toys and so on in it, right? So my aunt, when she would have purchased her stuff, because it was I lived with it was myself, her, her husband, and her two children. So they, they would give you these little tickets and you would write your name on it. So she had three, so she wrote one for me, one for her daughter, one for her son. And man, I wanted this basket bad. I wanted this long stocking. Anyway, I remember when we got back home because I came from a praying background. I told you my, my grandmother, grandmother was a prayer. And man, I went home and I prayed, say, Lord Jesus, let me win this thing. Please, Lord. <laughs> please, please. And I believed I was going to get it. Now, at that point in my life, I never knew nothing about speaking it into existence, such as the scripture that says, call those things that be not as though they are. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. But I realized, and I'm going to give you another example, there are things that I spoke and believe. And I used to say it. I used to say it to my cousins, I am going to win that. That is going to be mine. Of course, they laughed. I mean, my head didn't look good, right? But anyway, I remember January, the first week in January, uh, we had just come home. And the neighbor, because we didn't have a phone, the neighbor had a phone. It was related to us. And she said, she shouted, she says, Kevin, uh, GB Millwork said, give them a call. GB Millwork? I ain't grade seven, right? What are you calling me for? The only thing they could be calling me for is to tell me I won that stocking. There's no other business me in them have. So, of course, I must fall down running over by her to use the phone to call the number that they left there. And believe it or not, when I called them, they said, this is Mr. Ewing. I said, yes, ma'am, this is me. She said, you are the winner of the stocking. Yes, I'm not shocked at all. I didn't tell her that, <laughs> but I was totally convinced I was going to get it. In grade 12... Uh, actually in grade 11, because I told you I stayed with my aunt in another part of the island, and on the weekend I would come uptown to spend time with my mother. So when my aunt used to bring us up, there was a, a car uh, dealership, car sales ship, dealership, whatever. And every time I passed there, they had these uh, little Fiat Spiders, nice cars with a convertible. And every time I pass, I never told my cousins this or anyone. I used to point and I said, when I leave school, the first car that I'm going to own, I'm going to own a Fiat Spider. And I used to say it all the time. I used to say it all the time. I don't recall praying for it, but I used to say it all the time. Well, guess what my first vehicle was <laughs> when I came out of high school? A Fiat Spider. And I could, I could, I could go back on many examples of this. But again, back then, what I'm pointing out to you is that I never correlated it with anything spiritual. I never did. I just figured I believe it, and I spoke it, and it happened. But when I look back at my life, there's so many instances, not just in my life, uh, my kid's life, the, my family life. Hey, believe it. And just what God's saying to us now, he says, whatever you're praying for, whatever you desire, don't just pray vain stuff thrown out there thinking, I may answer it. If you follow the protocol, if you've done what you're supposed to do, if you've forgiven others and the proof of you forgiving others, you're praying for them, even though they're using you. You're blessing them, even though they're cursing you. He says, if you follow the protocol, then whatever you desire when you pray, just believe it and you shall have it. Now, the challenging part about that is that he don't give us a date. Yeah, I want that car. You can at least give me a date. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, that is that is a done deal. It belong to you. All right. So these are the rules. What we these are basic rules, and I pray that you would go over them. Go over these rules because what we're about to get into now is the body of our prayer. What do we say? In our, yes, you want to be pregnant, and you're having difficulty as a married woman to get pregnant for your husband. Yes, you have a problem with this sickness or you was diagnosed. Yes, you have financial difficulties. Okay, how do we body this? How do we put this into context? 
What are the contents of our prayer when we pray to God? Do we just arbitrarily pray? Do we say, Lord, oh God, I want a car in the name of Jesus and just go do we? No, no. I want to show you some stuff here. I give you these set of scriptures here. Because what I'm about to show you, and I want you to write these scriptures down also, because you're going to see how you should contextualize your prayer. If you're praying for promotion, if you're praying for wisdom, then the key components in your prayer, the body of your prayer, you ready for this? You ready for this? Must be saturated with the word of God. You see me do it all the time. Now, let me point to you the scriptures why I'm saying this, okay? Okay. Let's go to Psalms 138, verse 2. Psalms 138 and verse 2. Why is it important to uh, put God's word in the body of my prayer? I, don't, I know the rules. I've met the rules. Number one, I know that the mere fact that I'm praying is that I'm inviting spiritual help because I have failed or or utilize all of my resources that cannot help me so i need spiritual help okay i got that down i know i'm coming to god i got that uh, secondly i i need to know the rules uh, i i must not have repetitious prayer i must forgive other people i must pray and bless those that curse me i i must not uh, go loudly and pray and oh i pray for a car and start speaking in tongues out in public doing nonsense no i must do it secretly this is an intimate moment between me and my god so and he says what i do intimately with him the proof of what I've, to prove that he heard me, he's going to reward me openly. So I follow those rules, right? Now, we want to put everything into context now. So in Psalms 138 verse 2, it says here, I will worship towards the holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou, this is the part I want us to get to, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. To magnify means to make something uh, bigger than what it is, to embellish, to, to make it larger than life. So God is saying here, because this he's saying how important his word is now. He says, I've made my word greater, bigger than my name. And, and the, the scriptures that I'm going to give you are all going to be relative to what I'm saying right now. Because I'm trying to show you if he regard his word as so important, then you should do. It should be important to you too. And you're going to see not only your prayer is going to be answered in a more timely manner. But this is where the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man comes in. It is not because he's righteous. Is what he's saying as a righteous man. And what he's saying is the word of God. You see me do it all the time. When I am praying, I am just saturating. And there are many of you who have had one-on-ones with. And I prayed for you at the end of our conversation. And listen, I would just litter that prayer with the word of God. Why? Because this is the key component in prayer after following all of the protocols to prayer. So he says, I've magnified my word. Uh, above my name. Let's look at Matthew 24. Let's look at Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew 24 and verse 35. Listen to what it says. He says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away. There will be no more, but, but, but my word shall not pass away. I mean, after all of the smoke and dust and buildings and everything done get crushed up, beat up, and you done kicked it aside, his word still can be here. So this is another scripture that is showing us the importance of the word of God. So if it's that important, I would stand to reason. I mean, I don't have to be a genius here that would be uh, wise on my end to incorporate it in my prayer. And I'm going to show you how to do that after we do this. Let's go to Isaiah 55 verse 11. Isaiah 55, and we're going to look at verse 11. I like this. He says, well, actually, let's start from verse 10. Let's start from verse 10. Isaiah 55, we're going to read from verse 10 to verse 11. He says, for, excuse me, for as the rain cometh down, 
as the rain come down and the snow from heaven and return it not there again, but it waters the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Okay, we got that. But listen to verse 11. He's now giving a comparison. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, or it will not. And what he's saying is, I cannot speak something, Kevin, and it comes back unaccomplished. This is powerful because what he's saying here, if you incorporate my word in your prayer, your word, Kevin, may come back unaccomplished, but I'm telling you now, you see what you're reading, right? If you follow the protocols and you're incorporating my word, he said, I could, yeah, everything else in that prayer may not be fulfilled, but whatever my word says must be fulfilled. So I kind of jump ahead of myself. So this is why, as I was about to say to you later, you have to, when you pray, especially on things that are so uh, pertinent to you, find the relative scriptures to go along with what you're praying for. And I, I can I kind of jump ahead myself, but I can I can clear that up in a little bit. So he says in verse eleven, "So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth; it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I am pleased, and it shall prosper. It shall be successful in the thing where unto it was sent. It got to. There are times I remember, man, years ago, years ago, man, I was going through hell, man. I couldn't even think straight." I say, Lord, just give me, give me that peace right now, right now, Lord, that peace. I need peace in my mind right now, that peace that passes all understanding. You said in your word, Lord, in Isaiah 26 and 3, you said, if, if my mind, you, you said that you will keep me in perfect peace, complete. It don't get better than this. But the catch is, I must consistently keep my mind on you. Lord, help me to keep my mind on you right now. It's difficult because there's so much going on. There's so much people calling me to, to pay this or I owe them this or, or some problem on the job or some family member. But God, right now, I feel like I'm being stretched and I don't know what to do. So, so saturate my spirit with your peace. But I know in order to do that, I need to keep my mind on you. So God, help me. Help me and, and think about the things that you've done for me. Give me the scriptures that I need to keep steadfast so that now the result of that you will now descend upon me the peace that I need at this very moment. And according to his word, if you did it that way, then it, it has to happen because his word cannot return unto him void. I love this. Oh, I love this. Yeah? Look here. It ain't nothing like when you live this stuff. See, it's different. See, they're preachers, then they're preachers. What I mean by that is they are those who live what they're telling you. And they, they're excited about it. They're passionate because they've seen it happen for them. And they're, they're anxious and, and, and so eager to see other people participate in the same rules because they know if they follow those rules, it's going to happen for them. In fact, they're sitting back waiting to hear your testimony because they, they, they know it has to happen. All right? So let's go to Proverbs 30, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 30. And let's look at verse 5. What does it say? It says, every word of God is pure. Now, ain't that awesome? That's awesome, mate. Because if I'm praying, and for the most part, if you're praying those prayers where you're hurt, oh, Father, God, help me right now. Father, I don't know what to do right now. Okay, you don't know what to do? Well, pray his word. Because unlike your word that is full of regret and pain, his word is pure. So it says, every word of God is pure and that he is a shield to those that put their trust in him. But who is him? His word. So the scripture is saying to me, listen, the, the minute you commit to my word in your prayer, I'm putting this extra layer of defense around you. I already have the, you, you, if you put on the whole arm of God, you got that. I already sent the, in, the angelic hosts to keep, get, give command over you. You already got the blood of Jesus covering you. Uh, Job uh, 1 and 10, you got the hedge of protection. He says, now, if you commit to my word, which is pure, he says, every word of God is pure, and he is a shield now. This is another layer of protection. He is a shield unto those that put their trust in him or his word. Same thing. 
interchangeable because he is his word, according to uh, John uh, 1, verses 1 to 2. So God is showing you here, it is all about my word. That's why I got Kevin always teaching you all my word. That's why I have Kevin always littering you all with scriptures. Either when he's teaching it, when he's praying it, when he's counseling you, he's always giving you the word, not to impress you. Because Kevin came to the realization that everything hinges on the word of God. I don't care how articulate you are in your speech. I don't care how brilliant you are with your uh, education. I don't care how educated you are. I don't care how much degrees. I don't care what you call yourself. If, if you, if you and are using the word of God, and you got these intellectual prayers. Oh man, I and I say God to hear you. But I, I can assure you, he'll be quicker to hear you if you are praying his word here. Chapter 30. So let's look at uh let's look at uh I sorry, Psalms 119, verse 89. I like this one. Psalms 119, verse 89. This is a very beautiful scripture. And listen to what it says here. It says, Forever, O Lord, thy word. But I want you to circle the word forever. This ain't a one-time thing. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. <laughs> Boy, listen. I, I don't know if you guys are like me, right? I am a very... Visual person. If, if you're talking to me or if I'm reading something, and I, and I guess that helps me to understand it better, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, it's almost like when you're talking, it's like you're painting to me in my mind. You're drawing stuff up because I see images when you speak. So when I hear the word of God, when I hear his word is forever settled in heaven, you know what I see there? I see a, a, a court case and the verdict has been read. And this is the final part of the case, meaning that it already went to appeals court and every other court. It's not about the Supreme Court, meaning it could go no further. This is the end of it. Boom. That's what I hear when I hear forever settled in heaven. So God isn't trying to change his word for nobody. But what he's saying to you, though, to give you confidence, he says, now listen here now. You see my word? You see what it read, right? So if I say you can get this, here's what I'm also telling you. This, this Heaven already ruled on this. This is a done deal. Once you're reading it from my word, Kev, this, this is a done deal. There is not The only thing you should be doing from this point forward is either thanking me for my word, praising me for my word, or consistently coming in agreement with my word. But you shouldn't be saying nothing contrary to what you're asking for if you're using my word to support it. So the scripture says that this, his word is forever settled. His word is forever settled in heaven. This is, this, listen, there's nothing to be discussed here. This is a done deal. The final one is Isaiah 43 and verse 26. And I love this one. I love this one because it, it now brings together every scripture I just gave you. And he says in Isaiah 43 verse 26, he says to bring him in remembrance of his word or remind him of his word. Now, does this mean that God absent-minded, he got Alzheimer's, dementia? No, no, no. No, he's trying to tell you exactly what I was telling you all along. He is more, he's more eager to respond to his word as opposed to your grocery list of stuff you're asking him for. Kevin, I hear you. You, you want to better this. You want to better. Kevin, I hear that, but, 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 but what are you standing on? What, what does my word say about it? Give me at least one scripture, Kev. Give me one scripture that my words say, and I can help you right here. Father God, I, I, I pray for my kids, Lord. I, I, I don't like how things go with them. Okay, Kevin, give me something. Mm, Proverbs 11 and 21. What does it say, Kev? Do hand join in hand, the wicked shall not go unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Okay, good, the seed, right? So, Kevin, are you the, are you the righteous? Yes, sir, I am. And you have kids, right? Yes, sir. So they are seed, right? Uh-huh. So what was my promise again? I said, no matter what going on, no matter who joining hands to do evil to them or whatever foolishness, because of you, Kevin, because of you, you being the righteous, your children is guaranteed deliverance. But I need you to tell me that, though. I need you to remind me of that. That's why I said it in Isaiah 43 and 26. Not I forget, Kevin. 
I showed you, Kevin, how to come before me if you want quicker results. Now, the rest ain't doing this, and that's why they can always be complete and look like the cinema and always just get better things and those who save in God. Yeah, maybe because the cinema following some rules you ain't following, <laughs> even though he's safe. So God says, remind me of my word. And I intentionally left that scripture last because I wanted to give you all the other things that this word says. So he's saying, now, when you get before me in prayer, remind me of my word. What does my, I know you're hurt. I know you're going through a tough time. I know they're not treating you right on the job. Okay, now what does my word say? They're doing you bad on the job, right? What does my word say? Okay, God, your word say in Proverbs, uh, I can't remember where exactly this, but it says that, it says that the very fear of the wicked shall come upon them, but the desire of the righteous shall be uh, uh, granted. Oh, wow. What? See, you're Kevin, you here crying about this job business and what they doing you on the job. And you see all these promises I got in this book. The time you come here talking fool to me about what they doing you in there. And I got all of these promises you could remind me of. I won't, I won't get my angels to work for you. But I can tell you, the only thing I respond to is the word, my word. So you need to give me my word. Not that I forget. I didn't forget my word. I wrote it. I know what I'm talking about. I need you to employ and to deploy your spiritual angelic host. And the only way that's going to happen, Kevin, is when you put the word of God to them. That's their marching orders. So when you say to them, uh, uh, the desire of the righteous shall be granted, now that they know your desire, and now that you back it with the word, now they have they, they don't come back and say, well, brother Kevin, are you really sure you want to say that? No, 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 Mr. Angel. That was your directive. That was your marching orders. So you see these protocols now. Once we're following, and again, once we know these basic principles, and you do it after a while, you do it after a while, they become automatic for you. They become automatic for you. So when you go before God, Father God, and again, any of you that I have prayed for, one on one, you know I always do this. I start off by saying, Father, I repent of any sin in my life, any sin in Mary or whoever I'm praying for life, because your word declares if we regard iniquity in our heart, you will not hear us. Your word says that if we hide our sin, we will not prosper. However, your word also says in 1 John 1 and 1, 1 and 9, sorry, it says that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So, Father God, right now, whatever breaching of your rules, your laws, your principles that myself or even Mary and her family has done, I am asking you, Lord, to forgive us of that right now. I thank you, Lord, because you've said in your word also that when you forgive us, you said that you take our sins and toss it into the sea of forgetfulness. With that, I am confident that you are not holding that sin against me. Now, Lord, with that said, then you go into your prayer. But you got to clear your voice. Don't ever think because you are apostle or whatever you call yourself, you're above the rules. Nobody's above the rules. We all sin. We all do things that we don't supposed to do or say things we ain't supposed to say. Sometimes we sin and don't even realize it. So to me, for me, to be clear, because I know the protocols, I need to be clear, what I do is I begin to repent for me and whomever I'm praying for. So I start off all of my prayers in repentance. Father, whatever I've said, if I... If I, if I did something that I'm not aware of, I ignorantly did it, I repent. Because I want nothing between you and I in terms of as a partition. So we have to address, we have to address us, right? Now, now let me show you how to pray using everything that we've said. Now, remember I said, when you come in before to pray, the, the purpose of your prayer isn't necessarily what you're coming there to pray for. The purpose of why you're instituting prayer at this point in your life is because, again, you've exhausted all human resources. So you need a spiritual being, being God in our case, to now intervene for you. He's saying in his word, I will do that. In fact, I want to do that. But there are some protocols or some rules and laws and principles that you need to follow. And the first one, you must forgive. The second one, to prove that you have forgiven, now, you must pray for those whom you claim to forgive. And now you must bless those who've been cursing you. So bless those who've cursed you. Pray for those who've despitefully used you and say all manner of things. Because if you cannot do that, well, go go, go wash the justice, go to work or do something else. Don't come before me. 
Because if you cannot follow this protocol, I will not hear you. And I gave you the scriptures earlier. So you have to address that. Do not go there babbling the same thing over and over, these long extended prayers. To Bottom line is stop trying to impress people. He says, now when you pray, do it privately. You could be right in your car. You could be standing under. You could be in the bathroom. You could be on the throne, in the shower, whatever. And you just whisper a prayer right there. But always, always deal with, the, with the, the, your heart condition. Asking God to forgive you, whatever. Excuse me, sins you would have done, whatever the case may be. Uh, whatever. If you've harmed someone, ask him, Lord, if, if you want me to go and fix this or if I need to go and do it, even though I didn't do anything, I just don't, I want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I do not want anything to hinder my prayers. I don't need that. So whatever I need to do to correct this, to fix this, then Lord, let your Holy Spirit lead me. Let your Holy Spirit guide me. And even if I have to, to apologize to someone who I take the pride from me. God, I can be real with you. I can't do it if you don't move this pride. Because if you don't move this pride, I ain't going down. So I need you to assist me. So again, you, you're asking God to come in. There's parts of you as a believer that you're still working on. Be it pride or lying or whatever. That don't make you not a Christian. That means you have flaws that, again, you need spiritual inter, inter, intervention. Hence why you're praying. So you have to repent. Now, let me tell you another reason why you need to repent before we, we, we wrap up here. When a person, okay, prior to you repenting, because in order to repent, that means you would have violated a rule, a law, a principle. And when you do that, that is the green light for Satan to invade your life. But when you repent, you bring an end to that order. Or whatever that the verdict was when you sin, and Satan said, okay, let's go now. He, he, he lied or he fornicated or whatever. He didn't repent yet. Yo, let's get after him now. But the minute you say, Father, forgive me, I repent, I sincerely ask your forgiveness right now. The minute you do that, the order has to stop to whatever it is that they were trying to, about to do or were doing. So it is mandatory that repentance becomes priority as the initiator of your prayer. This is what you begin with. You have to do it. And again, don't ask God to forgive you, hello, if you ain't forgiven the people who do you wrong. He say, while standing, what did he say to do? What did he say to do? He say, while standing, you must what? Forgive. Why? So that your heavenly father could do who? I didn't hear that. Forgive you. So that means he ain't going to forgive you. Let's be clear here. He will not, if you've been walking around with hate in your heart for years, and you've been also praying for years, and in those years, you were saying, God, forgive me for lying, forgive me for God. He never forgave you according to that scripture. He never threw it in the sea of forgetfulness according to that scripture. Because it's a catch. He says, while praying, this is what you do first. This is the law of first mention. This is the first protocol. You must forgive. Then he says, so that I can forgive you. So, what do we do? Now that we follow all of that, we want to pray... Uh, like I said, for peace. You're praying for peace, all right? So you go to, for those of you who are not uh, biblically inclined, you may not know the Bible like myself and others, but then there's a tool called Google. So whatever you're going through, is it, is it emotional hurt? Is it whatever? Google it. Google uh, hurt slash uh, Bible or scripture, or I put, uh, King James Version, KJV, and click search. And Google can bring you up some scriptures. So what you do now is you go and you look at those scriptures to see if it's relative to what you're dealing with. And if it is, you write it down. And you write it on a piece of paper. And that's another thing. You don't have to pray with your eyes closed. There's no rule that says that you have to do it. So you write it down. And after you follow the protocol and you pray, Father God, uh, your word declares, uh, I am going through some tough times right now. I'm depressed, Lord. I feel hurt. And your word declares in Isaiah 60, uh, verse 3, I think it is, where it says that you give me, uh, the, I think, the garment of praise to eradicate the spirit of heaviness, which means depression. So you find those scriptures. And again, what do he say in Isaiah? Where was that again? Isaiah 43, verse 26. He said, now to bring me in remembrance of my word. Kevin, I know what you're here for. Kevin, you don't think I already knew 
what was going to happen to you? I knew this, Kevin. For you not to know that then you challenging my sovereignty. So you starting off wrong here. You should already know, God, no, God, I know. And this should be your prayer, though. God, I know. I know why. I know you know why I'm even coming here before I even utter what I have to say. I know this. So I can, I can do it the right way. Yes, I'm hurt, or yes, I need peace, or whatever the case may be. So God, I'm giving you back your word. And now you begin to pray the word. Father, your word is clear. And you say what the word is. Then you say, Lord, you said, let every man be a liar, but let you, O oh God, be true. Your word says, Father God, uh, uh, your word cannot return unto you void. So these are the things you say to say, God, and I believe it. This is what you say. That's what I believe. I've, I've done what you say. I've forgiven Sally. I've forgiven Mary and Pookie. All of them. <laughs> so God, if there's any residue of unforgiveness, anger, whatever is in my heart that will stop you from uh, addressing my request, then let your Holy Spirit convict me because I need to address that. Yeah. Remember I told you all this story a couple of times. I told you all how when I first got saved, well, I'd say about six months in, when the Lord told me all those women who you lie to, all those women who you, who you run game with, now you go back and you apologize to them. I apologize to them, but I ain't doing that. <laughs> but of course, back then, man, listen, I had a hunger for God, but I, I wanted to get it right. I, I live a life of nonsense up until uh, 1996 when I got saved. I was 26 years old, and I, I, I gave my life uh, to the Lord, man, and I when he laid that one on me, I was like, well, I ain't know about that. I can't go tell them that because to tell them that, I mean, to I basically tell them, I, I've been lying to you, <laughs> okay? So I prayed. I said, Lord, you know, you got to give me the grace to do this. And he did. He did. He did, boy. And I went to them and I tell them, boy, they had some words for me. One in particular, I always tell you, but all right, boy, she let me have it. You don't get your blankety blank, get the blanky, you. Because I come off first, you know, I, I'm saved now. And, you know, I just want to do the right thing and live for the Lord. Because I figured I'll kind of ease it. Because they'll have some kind of, even if they're going to respect for me, they'll have some respect for the God in me. Well, this one wasn't having it. Yeah, I, I respect God, but you can get a piece of cussing. You can get it now. <laughs> so, so when she, she let me have it. And I was deserving of it. I, I, I did wrong. I did wrong. And, and I, when I did it though, and those who I couldn't locate on the island, I got their numbers and I would call them, you know, and most of it went okay. But this one particular one, boy, she put it on me. She let me have it, boy. You, 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 but you save, you know, God, you get your, oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, ma'am. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> like, like, ma'am. But we're good friends today. We are excellent friends today. And I thank God for those experiences because now I can tell you my experiences that even though it's difficult, once I did it, there was a load off of me. Not only that, things began to move in my life. Some stuff that was stuck for years. And it's amazing how, that's why I tell you repentance is key. And if God tells you go and fix it with someone, put that pride down because that same thing is blocking or giving the devil the, the order and the right to keep you anchored to a certain place. But the minute you address that, I promise you, Shaw's my name is Kevin L. Ewing, you're going to see some things moving in your life. You're going to see some things going forward in your life. So this is why prayer and being attentive to what God's saying to you during prayer is going to be key now because these are going to be your instructions for the way forward. That's going to be your instructions. So we have to saturate our prayers with the word of God. You have to. You have to become acquainted with the scriptures. There are certain scriptures that when you read the Bible, it will just stand up. Write that down. You know, there's certain scriptures you might hear. I wouldn't even say by accident, but it's, you would hear whether it's someone preaching, whatever. Whatever it is, write that scripture, that verse, and that chapter down. And, and write it. When I say write it down, literally write it out on a piece of paper. Okay? And, and, and I, I promise you, some way along the line up the road, this, this can be important. But pray it. If it's something that dealing with you at that time, too, pray it. Put that in your prayer. It's almost like, it's almost like uh, making a good meal. The, the scriptures is putting the ingredients. You're putting all this, this uh, onion and, and, and bell peppers and thyme. That's what the scriptures are. And you're putting all of that in there. You mix that up. 
and then you rest it there and let it just do what it's supposed to do. Put it in the baker or go fry it, whatever the case may be. And you can turn it to something delicious, and that's just how prayers. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you from experience. I have lived this. I I know this. I've seen this happen in many areas of my life, even to this day. You know, my my wife, she will tell you the the biggest belief of God is myself. When we discuss something and, and we're going to pray, or fight, I tell her when we get up, this is a done deal. We can see this happen. You know, we're going to see this manifest. You, When you talk about this again, D, you're going to be saying, Kevin, you did say this. I say, I know I say it because I, I have confidence, not me, you know, the word of God, which I'm putting this on. I spoke to a lady uh, yesterday. Uh, she called me. It was a situation with her son. And, you know, she talked, she talked, she talked. And I shared some advice with her. I said, you know what, let me, let's pray for him right now. Let's pray for him right now. We begin to pray. We begin to pray for him. And I remember using that same scripture, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not go unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. I say, Mom, you, you are the righteousness of God. And a part of the benefits that comes along with that, God says, I am your children. I don't, they could be alcoholics. They could be on the wrong part in life. It doesn't matter. According to the word of God, they are guaranteed deliverance. But you got to remind him of his word. It ain't just automatically happen. Just remind him of his word. So then I used this other scripture while we were praying. I said, uh, Father God, I join my faith with uh, sister so and so. And we stand on Matthew 18 verse 19, where your word says that wherever two or more of us touching anything on this earth shall ask of your father, it shall be done. Father God, we're touching me and so and so. We're touching our son right now. And we are coming in agreement right now, Lord, that you would break this hex, this spell, this stronghold of him. And according to your word, Father God, you're not only hearing us, but you are going to answer us. So when you pray the word, you pray in with not your confidence, but the confidence of the, 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 the invisible God that you have now invited into your affairs to do what you could not do under normal circumstances. I love it. I said, I don't know about y'all right now. I feel like praying right now. I love to pray. <laughs> I love it. Because again, when you when you develop a relationship with your God, when you and, and, and developing that relationship is really acquainting yourself with the word of God, then you don't have to feel for words. You don't have to to be like, oh Father God, I know I asked you for this car, but Lord, oh Lord, what are you gonna say next? Oh yeah, let it be blue, Jesus. Yeah, like blue with a white stripe around it. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. And and let the muffler, let it be two turbo muffler, Jesus. What else? What else? What else? Uh, yeah, let interior, let interior, Jesus. Let it in. Oh, hallelujah. Let interior, yeah. Let interior, let it trim a little gold, you know, Jesus. Let's throw a little gold up in there. No, 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 no. <laughs> See, again, when you have a relationship with God, I want to I want you to leave with this today. When you have a relationship with God as it relates to your prayer, you're going to pray more of your word, more of his word, sorry, than what you actually came there to him for. I promise you this. Because, and, and you know what they're saying too? This is, this is empirical evidence that uh, your confidence is more in his word than it is in the thing that you're requesting from him. Your, in fact, your word is gonna, his word is going to give you the confidence. His word is going to give you the confidence that this here is what I need to go forward. <sighs> well, I see. Sorry, we're having trouble playing this video. Look like my video. My video uh, look like it's going out. So I don't know if you guys can see me. Can you guys see me and hear me? Because from what I can see here. You know, nothing happening. That's the devil, though. That's the devil. I ain't gonna have him. So, let me see what I can get back on here. Everything going blank? <laughs> I tell you. Oh! Okay, guys. I don't know if you still can hear me. Uh, let me know. You can hear me? Someone said yes. Okay. Oh, you can see me, too. All right. Because my stuff went well, Let me continue, then, because everything looks like it went blank. I can't see them, so I'll just pretend as if I can see me <laughs> in any event. So, yeah, so that is how we pray, and that is how I advise you to pray. I'm finished, I'm actually done. So I'm just going to pray with you before I leave. Heavenly Father, I thank you. 
I thank you for the opportunity to once again teach your people. I thank you for allowing them to tune in. Father, I repent of any sin, any iniquity, any transgression in my life or even their life. Anything that will cause you to not hear us, to not pay attention, to not give us an audience with you. Father, whatever injunctions are in our life as a result of being in breach of your rules, your laws, your principles, we truly ask your forgiveness, Lord. We confess our sins. You said if we confess our sin, 1 John 1 and 9, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. With that said, by faith, Lord, we believe, I believe, that, that not only have you forgiven us of our sins, transgressions, and iniquity as a result of our confessing them, but you have made this awesome promise in your word that you will now toss them into the sea of forgetfulness. And I believe that. I believe right now, at this moment, if we have prayed that, we are right now sinless. I don't know what's going to happen a couple of minutes from now. I don't know what's going to happen a couple of hours from now or later on in the day. I don't know what violation we may do, but right now, according to that law, we are sinless. And with that said, Father God, I now outfit this people with the whole armor of God, their helmet of salvation, their breastplate of righteousness, their shield of faith, their sword, which is the living word of God, their belt of truth and their shoes shut with the preparation of the peace of the gospel. According to Job 1 and 10, I pray the hedge of protection around them. I pray your word in Psalms 91, 11, and 12 that says, For you have given your angels charge over them to keep them in all their ways, that if they as much as dash their foot against a stone, it is these same angels that will gather them up in their arms. This is your word. You said to remind you of your word. Well, your word says in Psalms 115, verse 14, it says, You will increase us more and more, us and our children. This is your word. Your word says in uh, Proverbs 3 and 3, it says that we must not forsake mercy, neither truth, but bind it upon our necks and write it upon the tables of our hearts. And in so doing shall we find favor, and good understanding before God and man. I pray for every husband out there, everyone who is married, everyone, especially the husbands. The word of God is clear, and it says in uh, Proverbs uh, 18 and 22, it says, He that finds a wife finds a good thing, but I love the promise, and shall obtain favor from the Lord. Father God, every husband, listen to me right now. Cause the favor that is that they're entitled to as a result of their partner. Cause that favor to come to them right now, wherever it is needed in their life right now, whether it's on the job, whether it's with a contract, whether it's with whatever it is right now. Because of you said he that finds a wife finds a good thing and shall obtain favor from the Lord. Let favor be their portion. Father, your word is clear. Psalms 5, verse 12. And it says that you, this is your promise, you say that you will bless the righteous, and with favor shall you encompass him as with a shield. Your word declares in Psalms 34 and 19, it says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but you, O oh Lord, shall deliver us out of them all. I believe your word, Lord. I believe your word. I believe that. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But you promise you shall deliver us out of them all. Father, we stand upon your word according to Matthew 18, verse 19. And it says, wherever two or more of us touching anything, and I come in agreement with those listening to me right now, Two or more of us touching anything, and I come in agreement, whatever they are petitioning you for, that we ask of your Father, it shall be granted unto us. Your word declares, Lord, that though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not go unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. That's your word. Your word says, Lord, that the very fear of the wicked shall come upon them, but... The desire of the righteous, that's us, shall be granted. So, Father God, the desires that we as the righteous 
have been petitioning you for, we bring that word to you right now. And you promise us that as righteous, as us being righteous people, this is what we are entitled to. You said we are entitled to our desires being met. Of course, as long as they line up with you. Your word declares in Proverbs 11, verse 31, and it says that, it says that, uh, Proverbs 11, verse 31, it says that you, Lord, shall recompense the righteous, or the righteous shall be reimbursed or repaid for the losses that they have suffered. So much more the wicked and the sinner. This is your word, Lord. And you said to remind you of it because you've placed your word above your name. You said that heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one tittle of your word shall pass. You said that that uh, every word of God is pure and that you are a shield unto us that put our trust in you. This is your word. You said that your word cannot return unto you void or unaccomplished, but it must accomplish what it was sent out to do. Father, I believe your word. We believe your word. We stand not on what we personally came to ask you for, but what we personally came to ask you for, we're incorporating it into your word because we know that you're going to honor your word. Your word is clear, Father God. Uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 10, verse 35 or 38. And you said that we must not cast away our confidence in you, our belief in you. For it is our belief in you that will work for us a great recompense of reward. Father, you saying now that you are going to give us, yes, recompense means to repay us for losses and injury, but you use the prefix great. So you're saying now that you're going to exceed in terms of returning to us what we've lost, what we've been suffering over the years. Your word is clear, according to Joel 2 and 25, and it says that you, you God, this is your promise, you will restore, you said to remind you, so we're doing that. You said that you will restore unto us. There's some of them listening to me right now who've been divorced, who their part, their, their things has happened terribly in their lives. But you knew that they would have, you knew that we would have suffered losses. And you, 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 you tuck this clause right in your word because you knew. And you said, you said in your word that you will restore unto us the years that the, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the, the canker worm, the locust, all of these spirits has, that has eaten away at our spiritual blessings that would have uh, manufactured the losses. Because you knew that would have happened, you put that law in place, the law of restoration. Father, your word declares, uh, where is it now? In Ephesians 3 and 20. And you said in your word, Lord, that you are always in a position to do exceedingly and abundantly and above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power or the word of God that operates in us. I love it. You said in your word that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of men the things that you have prepared for those that love you. I love that. I thank you, God. Just visualizing to my limited human capacity of the glory that you've prepared for us. I thank you for that right now, Lord. Your word declares in, in 1st or 2nd Thessalonians 5 and 18, it says that we must give thanks in all things, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. For this is the will of God at this moment, at that moment, concerning us in Christ Jesus. Your word declares in Romans 8 and 28, and it says, and we know, we being the believers, those who are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and we know that all things will work for good for those that love you and for those who are called according to your purpose. Your word declares in uh, Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. And it says that, blessed be the Lord our God, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings 
in heavenly places. You did that already. Verse 4 says, For you have chosen us in you before the foundation of the world. Father, everyone listening to me, whom you have jointly fitted in your body before the foundation of the world, but somehow they were rerouted for whatever reason. Father, refit them in the name of Jesus. Reposition them, realign them to where they should have been at this point in their lives. I now pray for peace over them. I pray, according to your word in Philippians, that peace that passes all understanding. They need that right now. Especially those who are stressed out over the the virus and the financial losses and the loss of jobs and, and not being able to pay the mortgage or the rent. Father, give them that peace that you promised, God, that only you can give, that transcends all understanding. You said in your word, Psalms 119, verse 165, and you said that great peace have they that love thy law. I love this. And absolutely nothing shall offend them. Father, cause them to develop a passion like you've given me for the scriptures, for your word. As they begin to consume and digest and to assimilate your truth, which is your word, cause your word to eradicate those things. I should have left them a long time ago, Lord, physically and spiritually. Cause them to spiritually regurgitate Whatever's in them that is not of you, whatever is becoming that petition between you and them, remove it now in the name of Jesus. And replace it with your original intent for their lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word. Lord, your word declares in the book of Psalms chapter 1. You said, Father God, if they meditate upon your word day and night, you said that they will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that will bring forth their fruit in their season. Their leaves shall never wither, and whatsoever they put their hands to, not might, but must prosper. You've said to your servant Joshua in Joshua 1 and 8, which goes for us today? That this book of the law, the Holy Scriptures, the word of God, the word that cannot return unto him void. It says that they must meditate upon it day and night. And in so doing, shall they become prosperous and they will have good success. Everyone under the sound of my voice, whom and whatever you have called them to be, Lord, re-energize them. Reinvigorate them, Lord. Remove the spirit of depression. Remove the spirit of anxiety and panic attack. Remove that spirit of laziness and procrastination. That spirit of being lackadaisical, not doing what they should have been doing. Father, everyone under the sound of my voice who have been subject to the evil doctrines of covering and church politics and all of this uh, nonsense. Father, remove the scales from their eyes and let them see your truth for what it really is. Cause them to enjoy the liberty in Christ which Christ have died for. The scripture says in Colossians 2, it says that Christ through his crucifixion has blotted out the handwriting and the ordinances that were once against us. The Bible says in Galatians 3 that he became a curse for us and he who knew no sin became sin for us for the simple reason so that he can reconcile us back to God and now we are now the righteousness of God through and in Christ Jesus. Everyone under the sound of my voice that do not know you as Lord and Savior right now, let the spirit of truth that has convicted us in the past who are now believers today let them make that decision that it's time to come on board. It's time to, to, to come on board and begin to do that which they were called to do. So that when they stand before you, Lord, you could say to them, Thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into your rest. 
So, Father God, we seal this prayer right now according to your word that says, whatsoever things we desire when we pray, we must believe that we have received it and we shall have it in the matchless and in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen, guys. That's me. I am done. I hope that this, this uh, teaching was a blessing to you. I did my best to break it down as simple as possible. It's very, very simple for you to do. Remember, number one, because there are three points that we dealt with. I'll quickly go over it. The first one is that the purpose of prayer is that you're uh, asking God or the, the, the Spirit of God to intervene into your earthly affairs in which you have exhausted all human help and resources. Uh, 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 secondly, you have to follow the, the, where's that now? the rules of prayer. And we went through them, uh, you know, don't pray out loud and show it off and telling everybody what you're doing, uh, repeating yourself and all of that stuff. You got to stop all that. Then it's the context and the contents of your prayer, which I just told you. Yes, whatever you have, you come into God for. Yes, you could make a line of that, but now you go. If you have a Bible, if you have a Bible software, I'm sure they have a search pad in there. But you could actually put certain words like love and hate and righteousness or whatever it is that you're dealing with. You put it in there and find as much scriptures on it. But don't just put the scriptures. Just study the scriptures. Read it. Let it absorb into your, your spirit mind. So that now when you pray it, whether you're reading it or you can quote it by heart like I do, you now begin to give God back his word. Now when you would have done that, you've followed the protocol. You've done your part. You must forgive people. You, have, you cannot hold it for no one. That's key. 99.9% .9 of unanswered prayers are as the result of unforgiveness. I promise you that. I've done many sessions with people on this, and it always boils down to that. So I'm speaking from experience, okay? So that's it for me, guys. You guys have a blessed day. Uh, I'm going to ask you to share the video with others who would really need to hear this. And may the peace of the Lord be with you. Amen and amen.